Hello and welcome to a bite-sized episode of Crossing Borders with Nathan Lustig, where I normally have conversations with entrepreneurs doing business across borders and the people who support them, with a focus on those who have a connection to Latin America. This is a short episode that I've repurposed from a conversation that I had with Jia Hao, our partner at Magma Partners who's based in Beijing. We recorded this conversation while I was in Shanghai after the launch of the KR Magma Space's Sino Latin America Accelerator and was originally aired as part of our weekly Doing Business in Latin America series with our China media company, where we share all the information about what's going on in Latin America with the Chinese audience. In this episode, I'm going to give a short overview of what we're doing in China with Magma, how we started in China, why it's important, and then jump into my conversation with Jia about how China and the U.S. are looking at Latin America differently, how Magma is thinking about Latin America and China going forward, and what we see for the future. I hope you enjoy this short conversation with me and Jia Hao. Hello again, and thanks for listening. So I'm just going to jump right in to a little bit of background before we get into my conversation with Jia. So I originally met Gia back in 2012 in Chile, and we've been friends and done some business together since then. Gia is a Chinese entrepreneur who started and sold two companies, his first one a search engine tool and then a consumer products company. After studying at one of China's best universities, he moved to the U.S. to get his math Ph.D. in Texas and cur- concurrently started a wealth management business for wealthy Chinese investors to help them invest abroad. We met in Chile in 2012 when he was looking for more investment opportunities in Latin America and traveled to Chile to see if he could find them. After working together on Magma Companies and Fund One, Gia and I decided to raise money for Magma 2 in China. After pitching some of his friends and past clients, every single one of them said no. Why? Because they didn't know anything about Latin America. So Gia knew the founders of 36KR, which is kind of like the tech crunch of China. And he asked them if they'd let us write guest columns about Latin America and the potential business opportunities about doing business there, the startup ecosystem, and things like that. They told us yes, and it ended up being a really big hit. Gia and I took the content that we had from our knowledge in Latin America and created a doing business in Latin America course and published columns over a three-month period. It was such a big hit that we created a company called Global Entrepreneur, which is designed to help Chinese investors and entrepreneurs find investment opportunities by doing global business. After we did the course, we ended up opening an office in Beijing for Magma along with Global Entrepreneur and proceeded to do a partnership with 36KR's subsidiary, KR Space, which is sort of like the WeWork of China, has locations all over China and Southeast Asia. We ended up working with multiple Chinese investors who invested in Magma, and we believe that China and the technology path that it's been on can help Latin American entrepreneurs um, with new funding, with access to technology, and uh, that Latin American entrepreneurs can help leverage the know-how in in China to do business in, in Latin America. We also see a big trend with Chinese entrepreneurs taking what they've learned in China and launching and scaling in the LATAM market. We launched the China LATAM Accelerator in partnership with KR Space in January and are also hosting something called the LATAM China Innovation Year, where we do in-person events in Shanghai and Beijing, where we focus on each one country each month. So far, we started with Mexico and Brazil, uh, which have been the countries in the spotlight so far, and it's been really successful. We hope that we can basically do education in China on the opportunities that are there in Latin America so that we can help companies from Latin America actually get access to capital and technology transfer from China. We believe that China's entrance into the LATAM market is one of the three megatrends in Latin America that's going to be pushing the Latin American ecosystem forward. And we think it's only just started. So one good example is Didi, which is sort of like Chinese, the Chinese version of Uber. Um, Purchase 99 Taxi, a Brazilian ride-hailing app for about a billion dollars in the last few months. And AliExpress, which is the international commerce platform of Alibaba, is one of the biggest e-commerce companies in Latin America and has 
taken a real look at opening up offices in the region and being interested in doing lots of cross-border trade. We've also seen Chinese entrepreneurs launching business models in Latin America that have been put that have worked well in China. And we also see that, especially in the fintech area, the Chinese journey of going from unbanked, no credit scores to one of the most interesting consumer fintech um, ecosystems in the world can be very similar to the path that uh, Latin America will travel. And that many of the solutions that came out of China are going to be similar solutions in Latin America. Um, more so than a more developed market like the U.S. Or, La or Europe being the model for Latin America. So we're really excited to be working with partners like KR Space and have the support of some Chinese LPs who are helping us push the Latin America ecosystem forward. And I hope you enjoy my conversation with Gia that goes into a little more detail about why China is looking at Latin America and why it's potentially a good opportunity. Uh, so Nate, you want to say hi to our readers? Hi, and thanks for being part of the group. Okay, cool. So the purpose of this talk is to um, make a clear view of how we leverage what we accumulate uh, from Magma and how we leverage China to build a clear path for our group. So uh, I think before we uh, give a clear picture of this topic, uh, maybe you want to give a quick intro of yourself. So I'm originally from Wisconsin in the United States, which is about an hour and a half to the north of Chicago by car or by train. I had two technology businesses that I started and sold both were acquired by uh, larger companies, one in South Korea and one in Switzerland. And in 2010, I went to the Startup Chile program as part of the pilot round. And I was, I think, the fifth company to participate in the program along with my business partner. And we spent the six months in the program and we ended up going back to the US after having a really good time understanding the the networks and the business models in Latin America and after we we sold our company I decided to go back to Chile and find if there were good business opportunities in Latin America and after teaching entrepreneurship at one of the best universities in Latin America working at a Chilean startup and fully learning Spanish I realized that I was doing everything that an investor does except the important part of actually investing money. So I partnered up with Francisco Sainz, who has a family office in Chile in 2014, along with uh, Gia, and we started investing in technology startups in Latin America because we had the know-how from uh, markets where technology startups were more developed, like the US and China, and Latin America was a little bit behind. So this is quite interesting. So this is actually where the story begins. And we are actually talking about the keyword leverage. So uh, which means at the very beginning, you leverage what you get from the United States to uh, accomplish uh, your goal in the Latin America. Yeah, so the first wave of startups in Latin America were just copies of companies that were successful in the United States. So. Mercado Libre, which is the copy of eBay in the United States, um, was the first tech IPO in Latin America. Despegar, which is like a booking.com or a kayak uh, travel booking website from the United States, but into Latin America was another tech IPO. Um, there's a lot of companies that did restaurant booking, they did online food ordering, they did taxis, they did Basically, anything that was working in the United States, they tried to copy for Latin America, e-commerce. Um, and that was sort of the first phase. So they were entrepreneurs um, from places in Latin America, but also many from the United States that moved to Latin America to take advantage of the trend that they saw in the United States 
to launch and scale in Latin America and bring it to a new market. Cool. So that's the uh, first stage, which actually from the 2004 to 2017, which is last year. So and actually from the last year, we see actually uh, Latin America quickly come to uh, come to the uh, spotlight. Uh, we see a bunch of the uh, uh, capital from uh, uh, Silicon Valley, and we see the bunch of the uh, we call it yellow capital. Actually, the capital from uh, Chinese uh, China uh, come to Latin America. So, how do you see this trend? So, why the uh, Silicon Valley's capital and the Chinese capital start looking to uh, Latin America? Well, there's a lot of reasons why. Chinese and Silicon Valley capital is looking at Latin America. The, the first is that the Latin America tech ecosystem is at an inflection point. There's lots and lots of new technology entrepreneurs that have maybe tried different businesses in the past and some were successful and some weren't that are on the second generation of, of new businesses. So they've taken lots of experience from say the first phase and are getting started in the last couple of years on their second businesses. The second is that the U.S. and Chinese capital see businesses that are working, they have good cash flow, but their valuations are much lower in Latin America than if that same business was located in the United States or China with the same numbers. So they see attractive investment opportunities. And lastly, you're seeing lots of foreign immigration into Latin America from places from all over the world, which are taking talent and knowledge from their home markets and mixing it with the opportunities in Latin America. Yeah, that's the, uh, you know what, we are building a globalization course for our readers. So one of the most important point we want to teach our readers is to make yourself imp uh, different is the key for to success as part of the life so which is another version of leverage so uh, you mentioned a lot of people coming to uh, latin america mostly one of the one of the benefits they get is the uh, you know the knowledge in their head or the uh, business model they are very familiar with they are not existing at all in uh, latin america so which makes themselves very valuable and uh, of course that value value from the they are different what do you think yeah, if you look at businesses that have launched in, in Latin America, you can find entrepreneurs who are not from the region that um, took a business and knowledge from their home country and brought it. So a good example of that is, there's a bunch of them, but one is called Nubank, which is a fintech company in Brazil, which has a U.S. founder along with a Brazilian founder. Another is... Viva Real, which is the largest property portal in Brazil, which was just acquired uh, recently. That is a U.S. founder along with an Argentine founder working in Brazil, taking the knowledge they had from the United States to build a business in Brazil. There's office supplies companies that are in Mexico and Colombia that are copies of U.S. businesses that have U.S. founders. So these are people that took the knowledge that they had from their local market and saw things that obviously were going to happen in Latin America and said, I'm going to do it <clears throat> instead of just waiting for someone else to do it. Yeah. So actually this uh, uh, to make yourself different, not only can apply to the individual level, but also can apply to the fund, to, to the company. Actually, we perfectly adapt this strategy to Ma to magma so i think i guess we we should talk about how how we leverage the uh, special knowledge we accumulate in latin america and how we leverage that knowledge to apply to china and make ourselves different well when we're in latin america we can see the problems that need fixing and so when we're there we can see that for example the payment systems aren't working like they do in China or the United States. So one of the things that we can do is find the opportunities and things that are broken in Latin America, go back to either China or the United States and find technology that already is working. Also, we can look at um, technologies and processes and 
other types of information and help bring them to um, our own our own countries. Uh, I think we just uh, talked about how to make ourselves different. The strategy not only can apply to the individual, but also can apply to the fund level as a strategy uh, level. Okay. The uh, last thing we want to uh, we want to talk about is the is kind of uh, how <laughs> how the United States and they they treat the, the Latin America different from from the China. So uh, we see it's a it's a big difference. Uh, so do you want to talk about it? Yeah, so over the last maybe four to six years, the U.S. has taken a step back, uh, especially over the last year with Trump um, from Latin America. There's been all of the talk of the wall with Mexico has impacted um, relationships with Latin America. And also U.S. investors are more likely to have seen movies and TV shows about uh, maybe drug dealers or violence or things that maybe happened 30 years ago um, and be more scared to investigate further. Whereas what we've seen is that um, as the U.S. is sort of taking a step back, the Latin American countries are looking to China and China is looking to Latin America and filling filling that void that was left by the United States. So I think there's a very interesting opportunity in Latin America, both for the U.S. and for China, but it seems like right now China is the country that is taking better advantage and is probably positioned better uh, for the next few years to uh, to make interesting business deals and help the region grow. Yeah, I think this trend actually both can show on the individual level and on the country level. So on the country level, for example, we can see from the big picture, like from 2000, uh, the trade between United States and Latin America doubled, but the trade between uh, China and Latin America go 22 times. <laughs> so, and uh, from 2016, uh, China's target is trying to move the trade between Latin America and China uh, up to $500 billion. And uh, the money uh, China invest into Latin America is bigger than uh, the World Bank, the C, uh, the the uh, the CAF, adding together. Um, that's on the big big picture level. And on the individual level, I think right now it looks like uh, we m are much easier to persuade a Chinese investor to take advantage of uh, uh, you know, Latin America. I mean, then we trying to persuade the the U.S. investor, which means that you know when we present the opportunity in Latin America, it looks like the the Chinese investor are much easier to to jump in and to join us. What do you think? Yeah, I think that there's some investors in the United States that are trying to be forward looking. Uh, there were some of the top tier investment funds like Anderson Horowitz and and Excel Partners. Uh, red point that have invested in Latin America recently, but you haven't seen a US company like Didi uh, acquiring 99 taxi in Brazil uh, for a deal almost worth a billion dollars and you haven't seen a company like um, a US equivalent of uh, an Aliexpress starting to do lots of business in countries like Chile and Mexico Argentina so I think that uh, the opportunities seemingly are being taken better advantage of by uh, Chinese companies and investors currently. Okay, cool. I think that's what we discussed today. And thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me and hope to uh, be a guest again. Thank you. Bye. Thanks again for listening to this short episode of Crossing Borders. I hope you enjoyed our perspective on China and Latin America. If you did, please share this episode in your network and give us a rating on iTunes and Stitcher. We really, really appreciate it. If you're interested in learning more about China and Latin America, you can check out a couple of articles on my blog, NathanLustig.com. And if you like this podcast and want to learn more about what's going on in Latin America, uh, you can also check out Crossing Borders on iTunes and Stitcher or with past episodes on NathanLustig.com. Thanks again for listening and have a great rest of your day.